uh, this is our Wednesday morning and our 8.30 meeting. Um, like to uh, welcome Senator Campion uh, with us, uh, who's with us to present a proposed uh, amendment, uh, which he has to ask if we could deal with that on uh, 658, I believe it is. So, um, uh, Brian, uh, great. Uh, would you like to present your uh, amendment? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Starr. And uh, Bryn Hare from Lich Council is also here. Uh, I might have her uh, sort of take you uh, all through it. But in short, this is a follow up from the last time I was in committee. Uh, you were very gracious to hear from me then. Uh, I appreciate you hearing from me now. This goes back, this is a, a revised study regarding humane treatment of dairy animals. I really appreciate all the outreach I received. Senator Collimore sent me information. Our uh, state veterinarian sent me information, Dr. Haas. Uh, some of her colleagues sent me information. And so what I've done here is I've re uh, revised the amendment uh, ever so slightly. One of the key things I did get, or one of the things that I did eliminate, you'll see, um, I don't have the original, but there was a number four uh, to things to look into. Uh, and this had to do with um, reproduction uh, around humane tr uh, you know, treatment or reproduction uh, methods. Dr. Haas and others uh, just raised the question of why that was there. Um, and uh, so I thought for now, take it out. One of the reasons it was, was there was in talking with some folks, it had to do with how uh, bulls are treated uh, when it comes to uh, the reproduction process. In other, in other words, actually, um, what they have to experience in order to uh, remove their semen uh, during the this um, during the process of uh, I, I guess it's it's an it's a uh, uh, I don't know what you would the term I'm looking for here, Bryn. You and I talked about it a little bit, maybe during artificial insemination. During artificial insemination. Thank you, Dr. Hardy. Uh, so. So what I ended up doing is just having those three points that we talked about before. Um, and again, this goes back to, you know, the follow-up from the work that all of you did on the floor and in your bill having to do with uh, proper uh, sheltering of animals. And that's the genesis of this idea. I feel it's very proactive looking at these issues. Um, and hopefully we can get something on the books that can be a standard uh, by what by which the state um, uh, can follow. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, Bryn, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that that was a, that was a great summary. I would just uh, point out that in this amendment, um, the agency is directed to consult with stakeholders that have expertise in the management of dairy animals. Um, in their in their in their work to develop some recommendations for the standing committees, and you can see that um, at the at the top of the page there. I see you. You still have uh, Senator um, something about tethers and tie stanchions and things like that. That's right. So those are some guiding things uh, to look into. I mean, one of the things that I have to say that was interesting to me during this whole process over the past week of after having been in your committee um, was to learn that livestock and poultry husbandry practices are specifically exempt from the requirements of the animal cruelty subchapter. So, so again, this is, I thought that was, that was enlightening. Uh, it didn't come up in our last discussion. I'm sure that you all know that. Um, and so again, I, I think getting some of this information, gathering it and getting it on the books um, is a worthwhile practice and a proactive practice. And I do believe that most Vermonters would agree that having some kind of standards there um, makes sense. Uh, other questions, uh, Ruth? I'm just wondering if 
Linda or somebody could email it to us because I don't I couldn't see the full text of the amendment and uh, I don't think I have it and I, I have will a... I'm putting it on the website on okay. the page right that, now that's helpful thank you Linda <clears throat> and I also just wanted to know um so I just googled really quickly which you know can be dangerous but um can be helpful um humane treatment of dairy cows and and it reminded me um, because one of the thing first things that came up is there there is um, a humane certification, and we did some work on this last year. You might recall Bobby and Brian, um, and um, you know a lot of uh, or or I don't know how many actually in Vermont, but I know some uh, dairy operations are humanely certified, and th there are standards in order to be certified humane. Um, and then you get a little sticker you can put on your cheese product or whatever it is you make. And we did do some work on that last year. And I'm just wondering if looking at those standards is what might may be helpful in your research. Um, but Thanks. Yeah, one of the things that um, we did change in the language last uh, week, Senator Hardy, it just mentioned that the Agency of Agriculture should do this on their own. But this language uh, actually asks to pull in, a, as Bryn mentioned, a wider range of people, a wider range of experts to have this conversation. I think that would be a, a, a great group uh, to have a, you know, to have a conversation with. Mm -hmm. The other person that might be helpful on this kind of thing, uh, animal rights, and um, could be uh, Barry Landere. Uh, I'm sure he's been in your committee before on different things. He might be helpful. Um, and there might be other people worth hearing from uh, uh, in the industry. Yeah, we've we've had Barry in several times, and then Great. the young lady, the young lady from another group, uh, worked with us a lot last year. And actually, we got a letter. We yeah. were one of the best states in the country, I think, uh, for taking care of our animals. And that's why when you came up with this, Brian, it kind of uh, kind of threw me off because we have been really working uh, a lot and, and putting bills through to make sure that our, our animals are cared for properly and treated humanely and, and you know, have, I mean, we've talked about how our loose housing cows sleep on pillows even and and I'm sorry, uh, what sleeps on pillows? Our our loose housing cattle. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. They, they have these big uh, canvas uh, filled uh, 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 mattresses like that they even sleep on for comfort so that uh, you know they they live pretty pretty good. But <clears throat> anyways, are there other questions for Brian, uh, Brian uh, Collimore? Thank you. It's hard when there's two Brian's. Um, okay. Senator, I'm just wondering, I did send you, uh, and thank you for acknowledging that, uh, the five things that dairy farmers must do for their cows as part of a farm program. And as we can remember, when a dairy farmer signs a contract with farm, they're saying that they will do these things. And two of them address the exact uh, topics that you bring up in the amendment. Uh, from 32 degrees to 73 degrees is what uh, the so-called thermo neutral zone is. And that's the range of temperatures between which the animal does not need to expend energy to stay warm or stay cool. And so they suggest that they uh, make sure that they're within that range. Uh, also, their third point was all age classes of animals have to have housing that allows for the ability to easily stand up, lie down, adopt normal resting postures, and have visual contact with other cattle. And then there's another one about the uh, exercise. All age classes of animals must have a method of daily exercise, whether permitting it outdoors. So to me, it would seem that those already address a lot of what you have in your amendment and that dairy farmers are already doing that if they belong to the farm program. So 
I, I, yeah, so it's a you know I you raise a, a a good question. I think um, I'm not sure if if we well I, I think we can probably do better. I think that's a start. I do. Um, I think it's worthwhile putting something on the books. I mean they uh, I don't know the details of the contract that you referenced that we sign. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see that contract. Uh, or are they more guidelines? Um, but you know, again, I was, I was, uh, surprised that we exempt our animal cruelty, um, uh, requirements to, to this, you know, to dairy and to, uh, to, um, and to poultry. So again, this, this looks specifically at dairy. I think it's, um, you know, I think most Vermonters, and I agree with Senator Starr, We've made a lot of progress in this state on um, on, on animal cruelty issues. Uh, I think uh, humane treatment of animals is something Vermonters, without a doubt, want. Um, and so, I think advancing uh, this to a level where we start to put it uh, in the books and have something to reference, uh, I think, is is a good step. Um, other questions, uh, Ruth? Um, I'm just looking at the bill now or the amendment now that Linda posted it. And I guess one concern I have um, is the timeline um, the, with this report by December 1st, 2020. We just gave the agency of ag a whole pile of work to do getting the um, ag relief package out to farmers. Sure. And I'm concerned about them being able to do this um, within that time frame. Um, so that that's one concern. And again, I just I, I'm I'm wondering if this research already exists and it's already been done by, you know, somebody else already in the state um, UVM extension, for example, or like the the Humane Society folks who do the humane um, certification. And then Brian references what's already in our statute. So I'm wondering if this is already, these questions have already been answered and we might be able to rely on something that's already out there. And um, I wonder, Bryn, also where is the reference that Senator Campion is referencing about the, the exemption language? Can you point me to that? And so I can just look at it in the statutes. Sure, I can um, send. Um, I can send Linda the link that she can post on your website if you like. Yeah. I I don't know if we. Well, I mean that's fine. Or you can just tell me so I can look it up quickly sure. on our online statute. Sure, I'll get it to you in just a moment. Great, thanks, Bryn. Um, the other thing I could just mention quickly, if I could, the, I just the respond farmers to can't. Can. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. May I just respond yeah. to Senator Hardy? Sure. Yeah, I just wanted to say. I'm fine with pushing uh, with the, the timeline concern uh, and putting that out, you know, uh, giving additional time. I think that's fair. I do agree that there a lot of this is is probably research and ideas that are out there in other states, um, other societies, if you will, by societies I, I'm re referencing more like uh, organizations, uh, the Humane Society folks like that. And that's why we put in there, you know, hopefully folks can consider broad a range of partners to, to get at this issue rather than just um, just the agency. Yeah, uh, Brian Collimore. Thank you, Senator. So uh, I know one thing, uh, Senator Campion, the co-op won't pick up the milk of the farmer unless those contracts are signed. And if you like, I'm sure we could find a copy of the contract so you could take a look at it because you mentioned you didn't know what was in it. Um, yeah, no, I didn't know that it was an actual contract. Again, I think, um, you know, I think a contract is is good. I think it's a good start. Uh, again, I'm I'm looking to move this. That's not law. Uh, I understand that it's a relationship, um, but I think it's time to take a step here and actually um, advance a bill that has something uh, that starts to put some guidelines in statute around what. Um, constitutes a uh, humane treatment for dairy and, and continue that conversation. In other words, perhaps expand on what that contract looks like. Um, I'm not an expert. Uh, 
And I think if the Agency of Agriculture were to pull folks together, they, they may indeed come back and it might mirror what's in that contract or after having spoken to other stakeholders, uh, they might expand what humane treatment is. Tom, if the, are there any other questions from uh, the committee? If, if not, um, Brian, uh, thanks for your time and your Thank proposal. You all. We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll consider it when we get the whole committee uh, on and uh, Terrific. Thanks. from there. Thanks so much. And if you need anything else from me, just, uh, just let me know. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. Brian. Thanks, Have a good day. I did send the link to the committee through the chat um, just to let you know it's 13 VSA 351B subdivision three. It makes that exemption. Yeah, thank you, Bren. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so anyways, um, well, when Chris and Anthony get on, we can, you know, sometime through the rest of this week, we'll, <clears throat> we'll review that uh, that proposal and uh, go from there. Um, Michael, uh, unless it, um, Mike, uh, Commissioner Schneider is with us. Um, and uh, so good morning, Commissioner, and uh, welcome to our, our uh, Zoom meeting. Um, we, we wanted to have you in to talk a little bit about forestry issues and and where um, you know where they fit into this COVID uh, nineteen uh, relief uh, package and if there are things that you're suggesting because you know we we deal with part of the forestry stuff and have done pretty well as our committee has worked with you uh, but we haven't heard a whole lot from you uh, in regards to how they're doing and and if there was something where they can apply for for grants or if you were suggesting anything that we might be able to do to to uh, help those folks and if they need help well, that's fantastic. Thank you, Senator Starr, and um, all of you for your interest and the chance to come talk about it. Um, we, uh, the short of it is, uh, I guess I would just kind of go back to the very beginning of the COVID emergency um, uh, relatively quickly. Um, forestry, logging, and certain jobs related to the production of certain kinds of products were deemed essential, which was really great in the sense that it was represented an understanding of the importance of uh, particularly certain wood products in packaging and medical supplies, uh, paper um, that were needed and also in short supply uh, and recognized just the importance of forestry uh, to the state as, as essential. On the other hand, um, it, it didn't kind of just take care of everything because not all elements of the supply chain were deemed essential and even those who were, um, found it difficult to operate given the precautions needed, the costs associated, uncertainties, et cetera, and gaps in that supply chain, whether it was suppliers or purchasers of, of products. So it's complicated. And the upshot is um, there, there are, we're, we've been hearing from, we did a lot of outreach and we've been hearing from folks, we're talking about everyone from um, loggers, foresters, truckers, primary manufacturing, processing, sawmills, firewood producers, et cetera. Uh, and Sam and our team in particular have done an awful lot of outreach and compiled a lot of this input. And what's unfortunate is, whereas in the beginning we thought that uh, they would just be able to plug into the kinds of relief packages that were being established through commerce uh, that's been established for agriculture. Um, but they really don't, they're just different. The way the, 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 that economy works and those businesses, um, it, it, it's not really applicable. So we've been working uh, more recently, I think uh, Michael Grady may, may actually know this by now, but I uh, just heard from Representative Conquest in the House and the Appropriations Committee, they've asked us for some um, 
we, we signaled through Carolyn Partridge that we'd kind of like to move for something. Um, and, um, and then they followed up with, hey, we heard about this, what do you have? So we're kind of, we've outlined a very broad, in broad strokes, what the needs are, happy to share that with you, uh, and are trying to you know, kind of conceive of, for their purposes, a way to, a program for, uh, similar to a, a grant type program to these businesses on the forest side um, that um, we're trying to kind of put the finishing touches on this morning and share with them uh, as what's been indicated to us is the house leadership is interested in seeing some sort of a additional package specifically designed for forest economy businesses. Um, I'm trying to be relatively complete here and concise, but the point is there's significant need um, we're happy to describe that to you. Uh, and right now we're working on trying to uh, have something a more customized approach that would work. One example being the 75% loss in, in revenues um, would mean there's just basically no one's gonna uh, qualify. Um, no one's left at that point. Um, and uh, so we're trying to create something that could work and get assistance to folks uh, immediately with uh, debt service, um, uh, cash flow, uh, folks are in, we're, some of the stories we're hearing is it's pretty rough. Uh, so that's where we're at with that, trying to make a quick um, attempt to create something that could give relief in a direct way. So, uh, Michael, uh, I heard from uh, 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 Mr. Taft from Charleston, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's a medium size, I would say, uh, forest harvesting uh, outfit and he said that you know it's been really really rough that some jobs he was on or has uh, where you go in and you have to remove the junk wood or the low grade wood to get to the real good wood and you have to kind of take it all out at once some mills are shut down so the low grade wood can move, but then you've got these good logs uh, that need to go to a, a specialized mill. They aren't taking the, the good stuff and you can't have it sitting in a pile for months because it'll crack and I mean, it, it's just rough. So uh, it sounds like you're on top of that part of it, but where, where and how much money have you uh, where's the money coming from Senate appropriate uh, House appropriations in their second tier economic uh, bill? Is that where it's coming from? Where I believe it would be coming from. It's, it's yeah. there. They've, they've uh, my understanding through Representative Conquest and uh, Representative Townsend, who's our budget rep there, um, that the speaker has indicated a willingness to include on the order of $5 million for this and have asked for us to, to work with those representatives to kind of frame it up. We've got a very sort of general um, statement of, of how, um, and um, I, I, Sam is on the line here. I think Senator, if, we, if you'd allow Sam to join, uh, he may have even, I know as I was waiting to join you, he was on the line with others. So could we invite Sam in here and maybe he could put some uh, the late give the latest on the thinking here that the idea is that by the end of the day, I think they're hoping to get actually I heard Michael O'Grady's name mentioned as like giving him something to draft into for, form that could be used for CRF um, relief funding for uh, this specific application. So I don't know if Michael has actually heard anything yet. He may be able to speak to this better given his work with them on how they're approaching it. Sam may be able to give a little bit further on where we stand now, but that's that's what we're trying to do in short order is give them something to include in what I, is that right, Mike? Is it's it's tier two that they're working on? Well, and you, Sam, you can get on if, are you there, Sam? I think he's left you, Michael. He, he might be on the, he might be, um, he's he's on your screen as, uh, as yeah. present. You did it not on video. I think he may be actually on the phone with uh, some House members actually as we speak. I know we Carolyn Partridge was going to be looped back in as well. So I don't know, if, Michael. Am I am I gumming this up? Is this? Can you shed any light on where they're at with this? Uh, all I really know right now is that they 
have five million. They want to pass it through an existing grant program, so they're thinking working lands. Um, and uh, they are been talking to you about what the criteria and the, the eligible expenses would be. Um, that's really all I know. I think some want to make it tier one and some want to make it tier two, but I, I don't think they've made that decision yet. I go in to their committee at um, two to talk about S351 and to talk about adding this to 351. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and so, you know, what we're what we're looking at is the same kind of an approach. Uh, fixed costs that these businesses have, particularly many of them are idled right now for some of the reasons you described, Senator Starr. So, helping them with those fixed costs to make it through to you know avoid foreclosure, bankruptcy, shutting down, sending people home. That's what we're trying to do is weather the storm because they have direct COVID-related impacts on their it's business disruption, and this would be funding to help them meet those fixed costs. We'll design the eligibility categories uh, with, the, with the representatives. Um, and that's the basic idea here, is to, to provide that kind of emergency relief for the disruption, shutdowns, and gaps in, in production um, so that they can you know, hopefully bridge to a, a better uh, future with some, some re re recovered markets and, and activity. Um. So have have you? I'll get to catch you, Ruth. Have you been helping any of your uh, logger people get U, um, UI or UPA? So they've been getting taking in a little money to at least eat with. Yep, we were pretty active right off in engaging with ACCD on their guidance and all, and we sort of compiled all the various resources information. PPP, uh, un, uh, unemployment, you know, what's possible, what's available, and then connecting people with, you know, experts who could help them through it. So we've done webinars, we've built a whole website, sort of a very similar kind of approach, just like taking what are the issues, what are your problems, and then trying to help people find solutions. We've been heavily engaged in that. Um, and trying to just hold it together um, and, and kind of coaching people and, and helping them find what they need. And some have made have had access to that kind of relief, and I think it's helped some. Um, and uh, but it's a mixed bag out there. Um, they don't have the same kind of flows of of revenues, uh, and um, so it's just been a challenge to a little bit of a round a square peg in a round hole. Uh, when we first were just trying to slam them in to to fit into the categories that were developed for other businesses, where it just doesn't really work. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, but yeah. And doing that kind of engagement. Yeah, thank you, uh, Rose. You're me. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm I'm here. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I guess I mean I think this is true for a lot of businesses. They're trying to be s sort of shoehorned into a general program and um, they don't necessarily fit. Um, which, uh, uh, but anyway. Um, I'm just still not quite sure I understand the disruption. If if logging and um, wood products businesses have been able to uh, been able to operate, I, I'm I'm trying to understand. I mean, besides the sort of general chaos of the of the the crisis, where is the bottleneck? Is it it's not in the it's not in the woods? It's in the processing. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, it it, it is part. It, the, I think the way to say it is that just because they could, meaning sort of legally or de, de, de established as essential, didn't mean they should or actually could or in fact did. So many of them, though it was nice to hear that they were deemed essential, they just didn't have the wherewithal either because of a disruption upstream in the supply chain or downstream in their in their ability to market. Um, or just the costs of actually operating under the COVID precautions or with folks, just a shortage of workers um, for one reason or another. Those various reasons meant that though they could legally technically be allowed to work, they didn't work. And that's that resulted in, in the, the bottleneck, the jams and the shortages. Got it, okay. I guess I just would one request um, is that when you're putting together the package, um, 
is that it includes the provisions about economic harm that are the same provisions that are in the, the agriculture, just sure. so that, you know, they have to show that they have had economic harm as related to COVID to, because uh, there probably are some that were able to continue operations and did just fine. And then others that were not able to and had economic harm. So. Right. Uh, yep. And uh, I'm no expert yet, but I'm learning about the requirements. Uh, and <laughs> clearly we have to stay within those, those sideboards for all of this, uh, which are, is challenging because, you know, there are a lot of needs and lots of people would say, Hey, we could benefit, but they just don't qualify. And we get that. And I think we agree. We want to make it legit. Uh, we want to get it to where it needs to go. And, um, but it needs to be qualifying for sure. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, how many, uh, to put a, a number on it, how many loads do you think a day were going into J Main, the plant that blew up? I don't know. I mean, it's big. As I say, it's, uh, it's about half of all the wood that's harvested in Vermont annually heads there or used to go there. Wait, a uh, plant blew up? When did this happen? Yeah. Um, sorry. This was um, unrelated, but certainly now exacerbating things. A massive explosion at a digester facility in Jay, Maine, the Pixel plant, which is now <laughs> offline and with significant reverberations back through the supply chain. And we're pretty much the farthest away, a significant contributor, Vermont is, um, and, um, and among the first to be told, sorry, we can't take your wood, uh, which you've heard from us before about the other plant closures previously that we've kind of weathered and danced around and been trying to prop everyone up. But uh, this is a real setback um, in, in uh, which was you know not directly related, but certainly has implications. And um, as Sam could tell you, probably the, the, the impacts that are even more devastating and problematic than the, the direct COVID. Sam is uh, smiling face has joined us here. Sam, we're just we, Hi, we started Hi, uh, maybe asking about a general update on the forest side of uh, the economy and COVID impacts, and we got right into our discussions um, with uh, House Appropriations and the request for us to help build a, a program for uh, applying some CARES Act relief money to forest economy businesses. Uh, uh, is there anything, and I indicated that you were probably on the line with others on that very subject, anything, I think I basically covered it, but other questions from the committee or anything that we could get Sam to address more specifically? I don't know if Sam's on. Can you hear us, Sam? Yes, Senator, I am here. Um, wasn't that plant uh, in Jade, that was around what the first part of May that 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 blew up. April fifteenth uh, was the day of that explosion. Yeah, and if you go on Google, um, you can see pictures of of that actually happening uh, because it was it was all over uh, Google, I think. And yeah, there's great video of it. There is the actual explosion captured on YouTube. It, it, uh, yeah, there was a truck driver with his dash cam waiting in line to unload his truck and captured the whole explosion. Um, I don't recommend playing the video at the vestibule at church. Uh, it's narrated uh, by main pulp truck drivers who were uh, quite uh, excited and upset with what was going on. So, um, yeah, you, you, you can watch it, just don't have the voice on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So that mail was taking 1,250 tractor trail loads of pulpwood a week. And uh, that market evaporated that moment. And they also had, pardon? 1,250, Senator Starr was asking how many loads was going in there. Yeah, they, and they also had uh, 13,000, approximately 13, 14,000 tractor trail loads of wood stockpiled there that was winter harvested wood. Um, they're a huge, huge mill. And that, that pulp is now being put back out onto the market because that mill is estimated to be down for anywhere 18, even if they rebuild, it'll be possibly 18 months. And so they're moving that pulp into an already oversupplied market. Generally you look at New England and that mill procured pine pulp wood from I-89 all the way to the coast of Maine into Quebec, Southern New England, um, and that market is gone. And now international paper and Ticonderoga is, uh, has warehouses full of printing paper for offices, schools, institutions. 
They have stopped buying pulpwood. There is no market for pine pulpwood from the Western Adirondacks to Eastern Maine, no major market. There are smaller uh, markets, but um, the impact is severe. I don't know if Commissioner Snyder went into some of the details of uh, uh, what I've been talking to with logging contractors, some of the interviews that I've been hearing, but we're here, you know, I'm talking to people that are seeing anywhere from a $15,000 a month revenue decrease on a small two person logging operation up to our major mechanized operations that are seeing hundreds of thousands of dollars a month uh, of lost revenue right now. And they can't work because our forests are diverse. They may make 10 or 12 different products from different species off each log job. And if six of those markets are unavailable, they can't implement the management plan. They can't go just cut certain trees uh, and only take parts of those trees to certain markets. So, so the markets are seizing up and the mills that do have a market for products are unable to get them because the loggers can't cut the rest of the wood that has to go with that job. Um, so it's a, uh, I don't want to cover, I don't want to duplicate ground if, if the commissioner already did, but I'm glad to, happy to answer questions. Well, you yeah, say it better. Senator Pearson um, has joined us and has a question. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I was in with the pro tem. Um, <clears throat> uh, that this sounds is, like Leahy going to talk to the president every time you try to get him. Every, yeah, right. Well, Sorry, I, I'd, like, I'd love to be with you, but I'm, I've been on this important call with the president. Yeah. Well, and he'd have photos to prove it. I, I got nothing. <laughs> um, uh, we heard the other day that stores are struggling with the plastic bag ban and they cannot order paper bags. And somebody had that, that, that those are uh, very hard to come by right now. And someone had, I sort of joked, I think it was with this committee, that we ought to put some working lands money into uh, getting a paper bag production up and running. And someone said, well, we used to have one. I, I can't remember where they're at, but are, is the, uh, are you guys exploring sort of market development ideas. I mean, we've had toilet paper shortages. There's just, I don't think we typically think of producing those things in New England, but um, are we trying to? And could you just talk about that generally? And then specifically, is there a market in making paper bags? Go for it, Sam. Okay, so uh, thank you for that, Senator Pearson, and hello. Um, the so the, the markets that remain are largely based on what they call brown paper or, or packaging paper. Your, your, the, the pulp mills in Maine that after the major collapse in 2015 and 2016, they pivoted to making the things that like a uh, grease proof bags for dog food, home delivery, food takeout, um, your, your Amazon packaging, cereal boxes, those kinds of heavier duty uh, paper away from newsprint and magazine and catalog paper and things like that. So that shift is occurring in the region that is that our wood is going to supply now. Um, and that's that's those are the um, what the representatives from those companies are telling me is they see a very bright future, as you pointed out, that there's a need for these kind of things. Um, they see a bright future there. Every single mill owner we've talked to across the entire region is very concerned about the supply chain that they can they may weather this storm in terms of the mill themselves but the logging and trucking capacity to supply them is very much uh at risk right now if we go a long period of time without them being able to cover their major capital expenses um so in terms to, to directly answer your question about whether or not we're exploring that here i think um we're open to anything we've been talking about it uh, uh, any market we can create that is involves less transportation using more lower grade wood that doesn't have the, uh, you know, the high quality building or furniture type value um, is great. But these, you know, a pulp mill would take, um, you know, a modern pulp mill is going to take hundreds of millions of dollars to build. Um, and they're the newest pulp mill in Maine, I think was built in the 1980s paper mill. Um, and even some of the talk that we've heard around like the type of the size of investment that has to occur around that. Um, even the supply chain in the Northeast US, there are times where I hear people saying that they think that it's, they're not sure that there's enough wood, uh, um, you know, for, for, what, for what they're building in other countries, other continents for paper mills and things like that. That's why some of these companies are investing on other continents is they can park a mill 
right in the middle of uh, some huge tract of forest land that, that has uh, millions of tons available in a short distance. It doesn't mean we can't find something or do something, but it's, uh, it's been a challenge. There's a lot of people have been working on trying to, to do something with this and uh, um, we would love to, um, but it's a matter of how do we, I think everybody's in, uh, I think that's what we've also been thinking about that. What are the durable, what are the essential goods in our economy that we could produce here that create more durability in the event of another pandemic or, or emergency? Um, and I, I don't know where we could, where or how we could start a conversation of anything of that scale to produce that kind of product. That's why the wood, the wood energy is, the, is essentially the first place that people turn um, because it eats all types of different species um, in, different, in, in, a, in a diverse type of shape and form. And it's a year, you know, energy is, is generally being consumed 24 hours a day around the clock versus a consumer product that, that may have seasonal or peaks and demands. But according to uh, Mark McDonald, Senator McDonald, uh, to, make, to make energy from wood, we, I mean, he, he went on with large numbers. Uh, I, well, Chris, you sit on the committee, uh, but we had to subsidize the Rygate power output by According to Mark, I think he mentioned hundreds of millions of dollars over a 10 year period. It's about 5 million a year, I think. Is that what we remember? 10 million a year, something like this. I think it was 10. And, and so that isn't a very good use of our wood uh, if, if that's the case uh, for, for producing energy. Um, unless you can uh, capture all the excess heat and, and utilize the whole thing, like maybe Burlington does. Um, so, so Sam, uh, have you been have you been dealing with house appropriations? Uh, Commissioner Snyder and I have uh, been in conversations with uh, with that committee. Just yeah, just recently. and so. I guess, you know, the 5 million that they're putting into working land, your folks would qualify for some of that stuff. And then if they put other money in, uh, in house approach, um, that will come over to us t at the tail end of this week or the first part of next week to, to push through and I'm sure um, you know, we would do everything we could to to help out. Well, that's so, awfully good here. We, uh, I'd, I'd comment, we appreciate, you know, I think some of you know, I was here at the very beginning of the creation of the Working Lands Initiative, big supporter and proud of it. Uh, we're just, and, and grateful that folks want to put stuff there. We would just, we've indicated that that's owing to the nature of that grant program and its structure and how it works and the statute. Well, requirements, we're going to need something more deft and direct. And that's why we're working on this. I don't want to necessarily pull away from that. But the, the priority here would be get to this emergency relief um, through a different channel. I just want to be clear that that's what our request has been about. Yeah, that and I think that's good because 5 million is like, you know, a drop of water in a cup. Uh, you know, it isn't going to go far with your with the losses that you've mentioned. Ruth, uh, you had a question? Yeah, I just have a comment and then a question for uh, com the commissioner. Um, I, I, we do have to be careful if a lot of this disruption is because of the explosion um, and not because of the, uh, the virus that we define it well to make sure it qualifies for CRF money. And I'm sure uh, our trusted lawyer will be on top of that, but um, just, just something I was thinking of to make sure that sure. you know we separate those out because I, I think there could be problems down the line and we don't want to have to pull back money from people who get it. For sure, I would just say, just to be clear, we get that completely entirely and we're, we're only going there to provide that added context, it's background, it's related, but right, it's, it's not, you can't make a, you know, for recovery from that, it's separate and we, we'd certainly get that. 
Yeah. Okay. And then the other thing I wanted to ask you about since you're here, um, Commissioner, is our favorite topic of the Forest Carbon Sequestration Working Group um, and S280. Um, I'm hoping we can still hang on to at least a, some pieces of that. And I realize getting you positions in this climate is not going to happen, but wondering if you think there's anything in that bill that we could still um, hang on to maintain to keep the sort of conversation going and the, the wheels rolling, especially given the progress that was made this spring with the major investment up in the northern part of the state for the Cold Hollow program project. Um, so just wanted to hear your thoughts and where you're at at this point with all of that. Um, I'd hate to have our, our good work go to waste. <laughs> Right, and um, so yes, I, I uh, been thinking a lot about this, and um, you know, it, it was a it was tough in February before COVID. Uh, we were okay. This is good stuff. We want to head in this direction. There's real potential for revenue generation. We think that's one of the main reasons for doing it, among others. Um, I'd said, well, we're gonna our report suggests we do a bunch of things. I've pledged that we're already working on those things um, without legislation. But um, to actually move towards enrollment, developing a project, assisting municipalities at, as per your bill, um, everything beyond the basics of putting out good and modern helpful information, everything beyond that is an additional lift. That was going to be difficult in February without some capacity being added, which you contemplated, thank you. Um, and as you say, now, since COVID, that just becomes even more of a problem. So um, we have staff are in, engaged, that are eager, we want to try to do this, but we're in a hiring freeze, a spending freeze, we're looking at massive general fund cuts, our forestry division is basically all general fund, um, whereas I have some mo room with special funding and, and a sort of grow your own kind of mentality and other aspects through the park system, for example. Uh, to make some moves, I, I really am b boxed up here, and we're going to have to. We're already starting to, in kind of an austerity mode, where we're reshifting, um, you know, putting people on only mission critical core work. Uh, so I'm really struggling with the idea how do we assign people this? It really comes down to um, that, that we, we are intrigued by the prospects, think it's good, a good thing to move towards, but it's significant work. And if we can find a way to add capacity, we're, we want to do it. But I'm, short of that, I'll, I'm sticking with my, we still want to move in this direction. I'd rather not have be charged with a study, have to report back. And the stuff on assisting municipalities, I don't know that you meant it this way, but it really says that we have to help towns develop projects. That would be a massive undertaking if they asked. Um, so again, I'm trying to be clear here that I don't want to just, dump on this and say, no, we want to move in this direction, but I really have to be legitimate about those capacity needs, which are just exacerbated now. That's that's the bottom line. So we can continue to work towards this short of any kind of capacity being added. Um, I've got a similar issue with the Trails Act 250 thing that's being contemplated. This is terrible timing for a lot of ways, in a lot of ways that, um, want to move in this direction, but it's a significant lift and can't really justify doing so in any bigger way without additional funding. That said, I managed to pull together through a, a limited service position with a relationship with a, a national organization that's funded us. I've hired a climate forester, a PhD uh, ecologist from UVM. She's fantastic. And she's. I've already got her on this and we want to move in this direction. I've added on my own capacity for climate adaptation in our shop. Um, I offer that, Senator, as just a measure of good faith that I'm moving in this direction, doing everything I can internally, um, but with limitations on hiring and no money and shortfalls expected. I think that's just, that's where this lands. I'll keep moving in this direction, but I'd rather not be saddled with too much of a mandate without commensurate added capacity. So is that is that something, Michael, that you know some of us will be back and some of us won't, uh, depending on the election, but it would be, I think, Ruth, it would be good for 
you know, if, if Michael could keep in mind that we'd like to get an update, say January, you know, sometime in January to how he's making out with, with what he's doing and give us an update. And if things have turned around uh, somewhat, uh, you know, there might be uh, ample room in the budget in a next year to, uh, or after we get back in January to add something if we, if we can, you know, and uh, move forward that way. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally appreciate, Commissioner, your situation with the budget and austerity and the positions and all that. I, do, I definitely get that. And there was no way I was contemplating this, the bill as it was drafted and the situation that it was then. And I am happy to hear that you've hired a climate forester and that she may be able to do some of this work. Um, and it sounds like you hired her using some outside funds or private funds. And that was one of the things I'm sure you've been contacted by the same people I have, that there may be, uh, you know, interest from outside organizations in helping you fund this type of work. Exactly. And so, you know, making sure that we're taking advantage of those opportunities. And if there's anything, any language that is necessary to help you take advantage of those opportunities, um, that's what I'd be interested in doing. Um, knowing that you can't do it with your current situation, but giving you the flexibility and the sort of backing to say you, that this is something you can go out and find resources to do if you have the capacity to do so. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. And in fact, uh, you know, the Nature Conservancy nationally has a big push with Amazon to, to, to do um, some climate uh, and carbon projects pilots. Uh, TNC Vermont has been, you know, as you know, have been encouraging this and supporting this and participated in the, our working group through Jim. Uh, I went right to them and said, okay, you guys want me to do this. Uh, you know where the pickle were in. Um, I got one word for you. You know, and they were like, hey, can you push this? I said, I got a word, one word for you, Amazon. Get me some of that scratch. And, and uh, I think they're actually looking into it. So Right. I went to American Forests, cooked up this arrangement for a limited service funding right before COVID got the approval, because I'm not sure I would get approval for that position now. Um, so jumped on it. And uh, that's not the first trick time I've used that trick, and I'll do it again, um, using everything I can to build our capacity. If there's something to your point, like if I can think of a way that you could be helpful with language to authorize that or encourage that or maybe even direct it, I'm happy to share that with you. I mean, I... I'm doing it through my auspices now. Um, we'll continue to do so and um, looking at other grant funding. Um, and um, I, I, I just think given the interest out there, that that's only fair, right? That some of these folks who are pushing for it, would, if they've got connections to resources that uh, I don't care where it comes from, I just need the capacity. We'll pursue it. Okay, are there, are there other questions for Michael or uh, Chris? Um, Commissioner, I, I'm not familiar enough with the economics of the carbon markets, but while we're talking about and lamenting all of the more traditional um, markets and, and opportunities for forest products drying up, wouldn't we actually say that the carbon idea is potentially one of the few growing areas in the state as a way to generate income from our forests and protect them, you know, unlike, well, and protect them and protect the large tracks. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if, if it would, if it's fair, first of all, and valuable to consider this not sort of as some weird fringy climate thing, but an actual source of income and, and essentially a new kind of market for our forest owners. And if we looked at it that way, d does the economics justify maybe looking at it that way? And could that be a way that we might help uh, build some capacity? Yeah, that's a great question. I would say, and hope Senator Hardy would back me on this. That's kind of how we approached it in the working group was it's, you know, it's not fringy climate thing, it, it, but it is fringy. It's not 
it's not terribly extant right now in our state or any state. Uh, so it is relatively new. It's somewhat untested. There's a lot of uncertainties. There's huge costs up front, as which I'll describe. So we are seeing it not as some fringe thing, but that as another component of economic viability for forced land ownership in the state. That's why, indeed, we want to pursue it. I don't think any of us is under the impression that it's a replacement for a traditional working forest economy. Um, I think it's uh, augmenting, complementary, and we need both. And in fact, for most of the demographics of ownership in this state, folks are gonna want to have enrollments in carbon projects that allow them to still engage in good stewardship locally in the production of local forest products, because there's continued adding there. So I think we want both. And I wanna be clear that we're not seeing it as this fringy thing. I think if it were, in fact, more plug and play ready, I'd be begging you guys to help me get this done right now because of its ability to augment, you know, and, and support in other ways of flagging forest economy. Like, it's just that it's not ready. It, it, it's stuff we have to develop. We have to overcome costs. And that's, those are the issues now. So I don't want to back burner it. I'm just saying it's not the immediate thing that we drop everything and do because it, it, it won't, it won't have the return immediately. And we have some, more pressing needs. Does that make sense? Where I just think it's both. I don't. I want to be clear. We don't see it as a fringe climate thing. It's very logical. It's just that it's it's not like accessible to us just yet. It's going to take time, and it takes work to get there. Um, well, I don't so really want to I, I appreciate that, and I, I'm uh, I want to figure out a solution. So it takes work and time to get there, but I'm not hearing that we're doing that. And so are we? And and I but I respect that you're saying you're not putting it on the back burner. What is it like if if we were in a uh, if if I was the commissioner and I said to a knowledgeable staffer that was you, what's it going to take for us to have this to the next level so we can provide this source of reliable income um, for our owners? What do I need for to to have this sort of uh, up and running in a year? Do I need one staffer? Do I need five people? Is it just simply not possible in that time frame because of other factors? I, I'm trying to understand um, how we can do a little more than keep it on the back burner, recognizing that you're not asking for this, but if just so that I understand. Yeah. I appreciate it. I, and, and others help, help me out here. I, I think what we found with our study group was there's, there are real possibilities for public lands, uh, particularly to serve, there's two kinds. There's like the investment in the public lands to get ours enrolled that can form both a model and, a, and help plow the way for private lands and also serve as an anchor for the aggregation of the small private lands. That, so, so there's public lands. I think we're a little closer to being ready to go pursue one we need, so what we need is a couple of bodies to focus on that, I would say. Um, and whether, and it's just unknown because it's so untested, could we be up and running in a year? I doubt that because of the nature of the protocols and the steps that have to be taken, but maybe within two, uh, as I understand it. <clears throat> and that would allow us to do this sort of pilot of a, pri of a public project that helps kind of break down barriers, demonstrate, et cetera. The real money here is in getting the private enrollments to support family ownership. And that's farther out uh, and was contemplated as coming sort of on the heels of us establishing a public lands thing, whether it's on state lands or municipal lands that could serve as the aggregators, et cetera. So I, I think what, what I'm reflecting here, my inability to give you is just a sort of straight up answer is that's kind of why we keep saying both the, the committee, the, the study group, and now Ruth's bill, sorry, Senator Hardy's bill would say, uh, you know, the secretary will report on, back on, you know, the feasibility on state lands, and if so, shall engage. Uh, we, we found that there's just a lot of complications. We got to get to that next level. Um, that's what I mean by it's not like um, available as a retail thing. You just go say, hey, we want in, you check some boxes, and now we're up and running. There's an enormous amount of protocol that goes into these things, which is good for the vigor, the rigor that we need about double counting and all the other greenwashing. And uh, yeah. because of those complexities though, it takes time and that's what we would need the people for. And I guess the point I'm trying to make is that even if we did just prioritize it and do it now, 
it doesn't end in anything. It's not like a thing we can plug into. We have to create it and then it's a market. You have to have buyers for the credits. We have to market them. And <laughs> so there's just not something that's sort of ready for us just to step in. Uh, we have to create our end of it and then we have to hope and, and be active about getting buyers and actually closing the deal out there. Is that helpful at all? I hope yeah, I, I, make- I, I get tired of the answer, but it's a fair answer that it's more complicated than that. I'm tired of it too. But let me, let, let me just, my last question is, is there an advantage to being out in front? You said nobody's quite figured this out. And I believe that because it's an emerging market. But uh, is it something that we can, you know, let Michigan figure out and then piggyback on them? Or, or would we be wise to be early? Both. <laughs> this is tricky because I think we, we, what we found with some of our experts was that at other states that got out in, in front, um, they all crashed and burned. They wasted money. They got nowhere. There's a couple of things now. So I think that, that said, I think it's the time is now for us to lead. And that's what we want to do is be out in front, be among the – we have a better marketing plan, I think, po- possibility of the, the Vermont brand, if you will, we've talked about is we want to leverage that because we think that our carbon will be more charismatic than New York's carbon. Uh, people will want our carbon, right? Uh, our story is better. That's part of this building of this thing. Uh, I sense that Senator Hardy wanted to say something here. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Bobby. And thanks, Michael. Um, I, I think that my understanding from our conversations and the, the many hours I put writing that damn report um, uh, is that uh, for the state lands, a lot of the work that needs to be done that you and your staff need to do, Michael, is doing a lot of uh, research into uh, what state lands would be appropriate and feasible for this type of program. So it's a lot of research into the legal aspects and then the scientific aspects and the use of the lands um, to make sure that we're getting the right public lands to put in the program. But once that's done, then then the next step is to do the protocols for the actual carbon project itself. The development, that's right. the, The first step is clearly something that you and your staff have to do because it's state lands and you're the department that oversees those state lands. And then the second step is something that could be done by somebody you pay to contract with to do that work. And so my thought is that second step is where the private money could come in to, you, you know, have somebody donate those services or pay for those services in order to get the, the, the carbon project portion of the project done. Um, and then the marketing, yep. I don't think the marketing is gonna be that hard, but um, because with the state land, the benefit is that if we do this work now, down the road a few years, we will actually have a, a good chunk of change, like money, revenue coming in from our state forests that would support your department and your operations and your work. And that, that I think right now, given the situation with state revenues and the economy is a really good thing to be investing in. So I guess my question is how can we help you, support you to do that first part of the work so then we can get private money to help you do the second part of the work so then we can get the project up and running and then you, you know market it in in two years this yep. year needs if we were going to do all of it soup, soup to nuts we'd need the i'm sorry senator no that's okay i just i'm just trying to figure out how we don't lose this momentum and and how do we get you yep. to do the resources you need to do that first part Right. When, and so I think the soup to nuts for us to kind of take it on and ensure that it, there's continuity it goes all the way from the first phases you mentioned all the way through to uh, implement protocols, implementation and marketing. That's a bigger ask for the initial piece, just to help us get through the sorting through the legalities, what's available, what isn't, where does it make sense? Um, I think that's that's closer to the analyst that you proposed. That's what we need. Because I think that person needs to be feeding into that next, those next phases, not have it be separate. Um, and uh, so I think that's kind of what we need is if we, if we could just put somebody to this um, to um, 
because they are connected. The, 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 the development of the project has to, the needs for that have to be informed by the analysis of the land's capabilities and vice versa. So we want, I, I would think it's it, at minimum, it's, it's that capacity to help us start on this, do all of that stuff um, uh, on the first phase as you describe it on the state lands. I don't think that has to be all that, all that difficult, to be honest with you. That's the relatively easy part. And frankly, we did, uh, Becca and, and Jane did some of that and reported on it to the, to the committee. We have sort of the rough bits of that. Uh, that led to, uh, what, what about this and what about that? So uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's the most hopeful thing is, is that, and I don't know if anything could be sh shaken out of all this to, 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 to do that, but that's what we would need now, I think, is just to sign someone that, that way someone's accountable to pushing this stuff forward, getting it done, as opposed to asking people who already have a whole purview uh, to add something and fit it in here and there, um, which is not likely. Um, the par private partners, public partnership that we imagined uh, as one of, I think the most exciting recommendations we made from the work group was to establish that, this idea that instead of, I mean, just having money to go, that private philanthropy say to support us just hiring a developer, that's one way. What we were imagining was cutting out that developer and using the expertise in our staff, existing and other professionals, and also folks like TNC Vermont and their in Middlebury, their experience now to build that brain trust to help us cut out that middle person to drive it down, have a sort of a Vermont approach to this that's that would be cheaper, uh, and then kind of create that capacity in state. That was one of my favorite recommendations that we made. It's in your bill that we would the secretary would report back on that. Um, I don't want to lose that. And I think, so how do we move that forward would be, I think is the most creative um, and um, smart thing to do. And that's, that's gonna, that would also just, that's, that's more capacity. I, I just think that's the best way to get to what we're all talking about is how do we actually do something instead of just studying the heck out of it forever. Um, so. Yeah, maybe just keeping that language, Michael, uh, and I'm just looking for language right now to keep this alive so that it, it doesn't get fall by the wayside in the chaos of everything else that's going on. So maybe that's the, you know, that's the language that we put in there that just says, hey, you know, work on establishing this partnership, something that that keeps this alive. Right. Well, I buy that and I accept that. And how about going back to Senator Starr's suggestion, maybe what you turn the language is, is a call for us to come back in January to report on a couple specific things. Like where do we stand on this state lands analysis? Hold my feet to the fire, if you will. I accept that. Um, where do you stand? What did you do on, what did you do without any capacity the best you could on this outreach and providing information? Cause that was the number one. So report back on where, to, just a status report. What did you do? To get the word out, blah blah blah. What have you? What's the report back on your uh, assessment of state lands? Um, and any any news or or what's next or what's needed? Perhaps we make the ask then for um, next steps, enrollment, and in particular the public private partnership creation thing. Just you know, kind of. A, I'm not big on reports, and I know you guys aren't either, and we've done a lot of it here. But it's a way to keep it rolling. Um, and recognizes the reality that we're, we're, we're not only, yeah, e even if you guys somehow magically got me some capacity, it's still going to be a challenge given what we're dealing with right now. So I think <laughs> it's, it is fair and reasonable to say, we're serious about this, Commissioner, come back and tell us where we stand. We're giving you a little bit of breathing room because of COVID, but um, what does that sound like? Does that, does that get check the boxes you need here? Yeah, Chris. Maybe. Could we add uh, just you know any updated potential uh, for for forced revenue at forest owners? You know, uh, if if the market's involved another year, what are we seeing? I, I'd like. I think there's going to be an economic case someday when we get to say here's you know Bobby always talks about his seventy five thousand dollar grant position that brought in over a million dollars. It's going to be like that. There's going to be an accord equation and one day it's going to tip and then no yeah. one will fight us on this. So just some metric there, uh, Michael O'Grady, if we could add that, I think that'd be valuable. I don't want it to be onerous, but just flag that. Yep. Kind of a status on the <laughs> market's conditions. What's what, where it's trending, what it's looking like, um, what's possible. 
Yeah, and something like any update on so that if there is, you know, I just don't want us to miss the economics here. Me either. Well, Mike, Michael O'Grady's been with us, so um, he's heard what we talked about, and um, maybe Michael O'Grady, um, you could put something together to cover those three or four issues and with a report back to the uh, both committees, I would expect uh, natural resources as well as us, uh, you know, sometime in January. Do you want a report or do you just want the commissioner to come in and testify? Well, have the, com have the commissioner come in and testify in regards to the issues that we just talked about. Is that thing um, you'd put in a bill or is that just a letter that we would put together uh, from our committee to the commissioner? Uh, how would that work? You've done it both ways in the past. I think the commissioner has been directed to come in and testify before in other committees. Um, well, he's, I don't know why, but he's never refused to come in. <laughs> Um, um, so, so can you, those, I heard, I'm, I'm balancing things on my end and I heard Senator Pearson say, um, you know, the, the economics of, of forest sequestration, um, current, uh, basically activities ongoing across the country and the economics of it, uh, and whether, um, worthwhile for Vermont forest land owners to pursue. Is, is that what you're looking for or do you want more than that? No, we wanted more than that, I think. Um, uh, I don't know, Ruth did you, or, or Michael Schneider, you want to repeat what you sure. meant? Yes, as I understand it, uh, so it's, it's that, it's Senator Pearson's request for kind of a market conditions uh, status report update of where it stands, where, where it's trending, right? Uh, but in addition, it was, what have you done with this, uh, with the, what did we call it, Ruth? The uh, education and outreach campaign of providing information to Vermont landowners about the possibilities, et cetera. So a report on education and outreach on carbon market possibilities for Vermont landowners. A report back on the status of our evaluation of enrolling the suitability and uh, eligibility of certain state lands. In, in offset markets. And so outreach, state lands. Um, Public part, uh, private partnership. And then partnership. a report on the, the status and needs for developing the public private partnership for uh, as, a, as a, you know, Vermont model of uh, approaching project development with a public private partnership. Yeah, Michael, it's just basically S280, the things that are asked for in there, but just a sort of skinny down testimony from the commissioner. Sure. Just, so I think there are four things in there that you could basically steal the language from. Right. Okay. We could, we could um, would the committee want to stick that in the bill someplace or just do a letter to Michael? It would be more official if it was in the bill, but we aren't really, what do you think, Michael, Michael uh, O'Grady? Uh, well, you, you have the opportunity to do, to do both. You haven't passed the 656 amendment out of committee yet. Um, it would not be difficult to add this to that amendment. Um, my only remaining question is when would you want the testimony to be delivered? Well, probably uh, mid uh, mid January, I would think. Uh, would that work for you, Michael Schneider? Yes, yeah, Senator. Thanks. I, I think that's fine and fair. Um, and uh, you know, and I guess I'd just say I appreciate having the actual bill language. Uh, two things: I appreciate Michael Grady suggesting that it could be just testimony. I would prefer that, frankly, than another report because that could get out of control. So testimony, but uh, an, uh, a requirement in, in the bill 
um, you know, I want to keep this thing going. I could get hit by a bus. Who knows what happens in November? So um, having yeah, you, being, might, uh, you might having be the direct as that's right, that's right. <laughs> so I would suggest putting it in your bill uh, with simple language that re that requires me to come back and report on these topics, but not a legislative report if I could avoid it, please. Yeah, I agree. I think that works. No, yep. that be that would fifteen be page fun. report. We agreed. <laughs> <laughs> the shorter the better. Yeah. One page, one page, Michael Schneider. Uh -huh. <laughs> um so uh is that fine with you, Ruth? You're good. good yeah, with that that, yeah. that satisfies me. I just want to keep the fire burning. I don't want our report to be worthless and we put a lot of work and time and struggle into it. And I think it's a yeah. worthwhile thing to pursue for the state and for forest donors. So this is yeah. this is helpful given the circumstances. Well, thank you. I really appreciate A, the interest and the sincerity in it and that what you see what this is potential here, but also recognizing that just the realities and trying to find a way to keep it alive, but not overwhelm us and uh, that you seem to be accepting. I'm not trying to avoid anything here. I actually want to get to success. And uh, and um, I think, uh, so I appreciate the conversation and the approach here and uh, we'll do our, our level best. And uh, cause I do, I also think, man, it, this could really be a, a game changer uh, for, for us with regard to our care of, of public lands, but also for all Vermonters and um, Anything we can do to empower forest land ownership uh, is something we should definitely do. And this is in that category. Yeah, well, I wanna thank uh, Commissioner Yu and Deputy Commissioner Lincoln uh, for spending uh, this time with us. Um, so I think we you know, made some positive moves here to keep uh, this issue alive and well. And, and I don't know, Michael, Michael Grady can send you a copy of once we get it put together, he gets it put together, he can send you a copy of it. And but we need uh, we need to vote this bill. Uh, I would I hope tomorrow or Friday morning um, if we possibly can. Uh, and so um, we'll try to get you a copy and Oh, hey, Sam, you want to call uh, Taff up there in Charleston, tell him how you're progressing with the probes on that money for loggers? Absolutely. Yeah, appreciate that. that. Seeing, seeing you called him to call me, uh, <laughs> maybe you can call him. Uh, well, well no, it worked. Call him. Pardon? Commissioner? It worked. <laughs> yeah. it worked. And we like that. Yeah. It, uh, well, we usually try to help if we can. We um, yeah. So oh. anyways, thanks to both of you. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully we'll survive all this and, and uh, we'll get a good report in January. Great. And uh, on that, Senator, uh, on the first part of our conversation, so we'll, you're, we greatly appreciate you, all of your interest in asking these questions and wanting to know what's going on. And uh, in as much as we might have something happening through House Appropriations, uh, that I assume you know that means that you'll get a crack of it down the hall, um, and that you have what again. What I'm getting at is when it comes to you guys, if if we manage to get something to stick there, when it comes your turn to weigh in on that, I just want to make sure Sam and I have given you what you need to be able to evaluate and we hope support such an interest. If you need anything or have questions, let us know. Uh, I've sent Linda a basic summary of what we shared with that committee on the, some of, it's a recap of what we tried to describe for you in words this morning. You have a short, a handful of bullets that I asked Linda to share with you that give you a basic snapshot of what's going on out there and what we're trying to do with this release. But if you need, yeah. all I'm saying is appreciate the interest and the support. If you need anything to, to really support the funding uh, and our approach to it, let us know. We'd be happy to share and explain and answer questions. Yeah, thank you Makes very sense. much. And okay. you know, we're, we're pretty good supporters of the forest industry. Uh, so sure. stay healthy yeah. and um, we'll uh, be in touch. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Likewise, likewise to all. Thanks. Thanks guys. Cheers. Good to see you.
Senator Starr, I know you have to leave. Linda was asking about if we're meeting at nine tomorrow. Yeah, if you wanna, we could start earlier. If if you wanna, uh, is it mess you up, Chris? It usually doesn't, but it might as it did today, so. Um, you wanna do nine? We have, I mean, I, I'm yeah. guessing if Michael can send us whatever the latest draft will be if we've, we've only just added a little bit, right? Well, plus I've got this dairy stuff that yeah. you guys have got to get tuned into. It, it uh, Michael can send you copies of that, but I want you to kind of keep it to yourselves until we have a chance as a committee to chat about it. Well, if Michael could send it to us today, then I'm hopeful we could vote on it tomorrow and be done. But well, I'd be, it would be nice if we could. Uh, Ruth? Yeah, I just, I agree. It would be nice if we could vote on it tomorrow. And if we have the language, I feel like we can do that. Um, the, the one thing though that came up in the interim here was that question about the um, uh, good standing and that whole email. Oh, yes, thread. but we, up, we've, got a, we've got a way to fix that. Okay, because I, I did get the list from Diane about there are four farms that are not in good standing with the agency of ag, but if it's expanded out, that's not what our intention oh. was. So I didn't know what to respond to Diane. I thought it'd be better coming from the whole committee, but so I just wanted to wait and see what you thought, Bobby. What no, Mike, Michael's got a fix to that. We've done it before in other legislation, and I think uh, Michael's got it figured out where, you know, Michael, you want to comment on that? Maybe I should jump off because I got to get on that other Zoom call, but Michael, you could explain that to the uh, committee. Sure, uh, you know, the, the questions is larger than, than just the Ag Assistance Bill. It's for any of these assistance programs that are gonna be giving grants to individual businesses or, or individuals. Um, I mean, the, the theory and the conditions are conditions that run through pretty much every grant program in the state and many federal grant programs is that you don't award money to people that are in violation of the law. Um, but here you have a different status or scenario. It's not voluntary non-compliance. It's it's people who can't pay their their tax bills because of a of, of significant um, impact to the economy. So I'm testifying to House Appropriations today at um, 1:30, and I'm going to bring this issue up uh, for them for all of the assistance programs and whether or not to notwithstand um, the tax good standing and set off provisions that are in uh, attachment C of Administrative Bulletin 5. That is what the feds did and that's what Senator Starr was referring to for the economic stimulus package. Um, the $1,200 that people received under the CARES Act, the feds not withstood their set off and tax reduction uh, provisions in the Internal Revenue Code, you would just do something very similar. Um, and uh, it would probably be included in either an appropriations bill or um, kind of a directive to, to the administrations, the secretary of administration, that in awarding any grants for individual businesses or individuals under the CRF, that, that the provisions of administrative bulletin five related to uh, set off and um, good standing and payment of state taxes will not apply, something like that. Okay, so that would be just across the board for all programs, including yeah. the yeah. ag program. Yeah, and then because our program would just be the the good standing with the ag agency. They would have right. to do that. So those four right. programs. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, that sounds like good to me. Thank you. You're welcome. I I left one condition off in attachment C. It's it's uh, being in good standing with your child support. Um, the feds did not waive that for the economic stimulus funds. Uh, it, it would be a question for you. I think that's probably more politically difficult 
to to waive than um, the tax set off and tax reduction. But I'll float that to the appropriations committees as well. And, yeah. and you're saying, Michael, that's their call. Like they're going to make this sweeping exemption for all the money. Is that right? Well, I, I don't see why it makes sense for one individual program versus another. If you're a business that's had a 75% revenue loss, um, you're probably not paying your taxes. You're probably not current on your sales tax or your rooms meals and alcohol tax um so the question is shouldn't that apply across the board for any of these programs and i'm trying to ask that the answer to that is not something we have to ask it's answer it's going to be something that appropes will add in one in a bill that will apply to all the cares money isn't that what you said yeah, that, that's what that's what I would recommend. I wouldn't I wouldn't try to put it in each individual bill. Uh, it's really about directing the secretary of administration not to enforce attachment C for those those provisions. Um, which, frankly, the secretary has the ability to waive under administrative bulletin five, but then you're just you're relying on the secretary's discretion in doing that. So basically what you should do is you should, if you want to do it, you direct, you say that, that those provisions don't apply to individual grants or financial awards from CRF. It's, it's, it should be sweeping. It should, should go across the board. Yeah, I agree. I think this makes a sense as an approach. And if it goes into the budget bill, is that, is that what you're thinking or a, a, a different vehicle uh, you know it it could go into any of the the bills but it should just go into one bill and apply to all all of the sierra monies so do you think i should reply to diane or should i just with anything uh, saying or just let this happen through the legislative process i don't... I, I think if you reply to diane and say that it's going to be pursued through the legislative process that's fine that, okay. I, I mean the agency knows about these conditions. It's it's not this is not a new condition. They're they're been in place probably for about eighteen years. Um, I mean, all of their grants that they administer now have to comply with that provision. It's it's not something that it's not novel. It's it's basic kind of financial policy you don't award to people that are in violation but this is a different scenario than intentional violation right okay thank well, you michael uh senator hardy i hope you will respond because i'd hate to learn that this is sort of getting jumbled up and being used as a way to uh take out our language which is very discreet in the ag relief bill uh so so it will be good for us to let Diane know that the, the harder concerns that she raised are likely to be addressed through a different process. Okay, I will respond. Thank you guys. Yeah. I, and we're meeting tomorrow at nine. Was that the decision? Tomorrow at nine, yeah. Okay, great. Thank and Michael, you. you'll send us the latest draft, uh, including Bobby's language that we, just so we can review before, uh, when when do you imagine we could see that? Uh, I could draft up the the forest carbon language right now, um, and send it to you probably before eleven. Before eleven, it won't be proofed by the editors by then. Uh, they're backed up, and it'll probably take overnight for them to proof anything. Um, but uh, you can have an unproof version by eleven. What about a, a full copy of the whole bill? Well, the full copy of the whole amendment or the full copy of the underlying bill? Well, if we're gonna vote it out tomorrow, um, it probably would be a good idea if we had what we're voting out. Sure, so uh, the amendment is not a strike ball. It's, it's just um, four pages, actually it's 11 pages now um of 
some minor changes to the feral pig language. And then you're adding five new sections um, to the end of the bill. Okay. Um, so I, I can send you 656 as it passed the house and then I, I can send you the version of the, of the um, amendment that I'll have done by 11. That'd be great. Thank you, Michael.